Thank you, worship team. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here, and I wish all the mothers that are with us today a very special and happy Mother's Day. Going over the announcements in the bulletin, uh, Wednesday at 7, after prayer meeting, will be a deacon's meeting. Uh, eat and greet will be at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, May 23rd. Uh, it's hot dog time. Bring your favorite toppings, and salad will be provided. Um, if you are interested in, be, in being baptized, the deacons um, have approved uh, a little bit different uh, system for baptism. On a Sunday morning, uh, we will have our uh, service here, and then we will finish up uh, across at the Brick Church with a baptism service. So if there's anyone interested in being baptized, see, please see Pastor or one of the deacons. I have a couple thank you notes. Thank you. Church family, thank you for the flowers and kind words after my car accident in Christ, Pam Henry. And then thank you. There are not enough words to fully express our heartfelt gratitude for the sympathy, love, and support you have extended to our family during this time of loss. Thank you. Members, we were recently made aware that you had donated food and help for us after the funeral service of our daughter, Stacy, which was held at the Baptist Church. The entire family is thankful for the work you put into this community, Lyle and Marcia Holland. Thank you. Immediately following the service, we are going to have gifts for all you moms. Uh, Rick will help get them out there, and Ed also knows where they are. Uh, so moms, don't leave without a small gift this morning to honor you on this Mother's Day. And we are glad that you are here, so don't leave without that. We're going to pray for the needs that are listed in our bulletin. To add to these needs, remember Sue Sorter in Florida. Uh, she's had some physical needs, and they had to give her some, a transfusion of blood to help her. So pray for Sue. Uh, she's in the hospital at this point, hoping to soon be out, but pray for that need. As uh, we look to the Lord, just remember these things as we pray. Father, we come before you this day. We do bring before you the many who are suffering with physical needs. We pray for their healing and your help in their lives, for Sue and for others. And in our list, there are multiple folks who are recovering from surgeries, procedures, illnesses. We pray for that continued recovery to go well, for your healing touch to be upon each one, to be with the families that are in the midst of these situations, that you might just help them and strengthen them as well. We thank you for providing for so many needs and the steps to healing and restoration of health, and we pray that you will continue to do that. We pray for those who are dealing with longer-term illnesses, uh, some with uh, difficulties that are uh, cancer or related to cancer, others with other types of physical needs, many of them that will endure them for a significant period of time, and pray that you would touch those people as well in a very special and meaningful way, and also be with their families, their caregivers, just provide your strengthening and your help. Uh, uplift all of those whose bodies are enduring hardship. And in their spirit, just give them strength day by day to, to look to you for the help that they need. We pray for other needs that are around us. We think of the needs of our country, the needs spiritually in our land. May this day there be many who recognize the spiritual need they might have and begin to consider the claims of Jesus Christ through the scriptures of being able to solve our spiritual need because of what he did on the cross. Pray that you would also provide for those who serve our country in the military, and many of them on a day such as Mother's Day. That separation for those who are apart due to military service is, is perhaps most burdensome. And so we pray for those families today. We pray also today that you would minister to the needs of our missionaries, some of them separated from the family back here as they serve you in other places around this world. We also ask that you would continue to help them to do those things that would allow them to share the gospel around this world with those who need to hear about Christ. We thank you again for being faithful to us. We thank you again for answering the requests that could be shared publicly. But we also thank you that in a few moments as we have time to bring our needs before you individually, many of these needs, things that will not be printed on pages for all to see, but personal burdens and spoken requests, we pray that in those things that we bring before you individually, that they will indeed uh, be answered in the same way as the things we pray together for, and that you might indeed minister to all of our needs this morning, because we bring them all through the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ.
This morning's scripture reading is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 21, verses 1 through 8, if you'd like to follow along as I read. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. May God bless the reading of his word. We'll have our kids come up for our children's chat this morning. <clears throat> All right. It is... What day? You, you all should know. Today is what? Mother's Day. What is, maybe any of you can answer this, what is the, the thing that most moms are given more than anything else on Mother's Day as a gift or something? What is the greatest number of gifts that a mom is given? You know. Well, what is it? Hugs and kisses. Actually, I'm not sure that's it. <laughs> Because I don't think they measured that in this poll. It's got to be something you uh, actually buy or obtain that they can measure. They can't sneak into your house and see who hugged and kissed that way. So, but it's, it's probably right, but it's not measured. All right, next. Flowers? Nope, not flowers. Nah. Flowers is a good idea. Give them to mom, but that wasn't it. Presents. Presents. Uh, nice idea. Butterflies. Butterflies. <laughs> nope, that's not it. The most purchased item, most bought item given to moms on Mother's Day is cards, a Mother's Day card. Have you ever gone to look for a Mother's Day card and you can't find one that really says what you want it to say? You ever done that? Maybe you probably aren't reading yet, a couple of you. But you go and you see them and maybe the cover's great, but the stuff on the inside, you know, uh, just not fitting, or the, cover, the stuff on the inside sounds wonderful, you'd like to say that to mom, but on the cover, there's this picture of this 90-year-old lady, and your mom's not 90, and you, you know, it just never matches. So what we're going to do today is, because I couldn't find a card that said, Happy Mother's Day from the children's chat of West Portland Baptist Church, they weren't there, couldn't find that card, I got a card that has on the inside of it, nothing, it's blank. And there's a purpose for this, because I'm going to be your secretary. What would you like to put in this card for moms today? From this front row, we're going to say Happy Mother's Day, of course, from the children's chat. What would you like to put in here? What do you think would be good? Maybe something you could thank your mom for or thank moms for, or something you'd like to put in this card, a, a nice sentiment from each of you. So now that I put you on the spot to think, what do you think? Happy Mother's Day, thank you, or God bless you, or what? A what? X's and O's? Well, loves and kisses. Uh, love and kisses. All right. To mom. Very good. What else? Now we got to start. We, we got lots of words. What do you want to thank mom for? Anything you want to be thankful for? Hmm. Yeah, right here. Be thankful for her hugs and kisses. Well, that's pretty close to his. We want to say something you're thankful that she did other than just kiss you. And What would it be? Playing outside. Playing with you. For playing outside with me. All right. What else would you like to thank Mom for? Taking you to the fun park and going with you. Ah, taking me to the fun park. That's a nice thing. What else would you like to thank Mom for? Yeah, you had your hand kind of up. 
For Solomon cut you off. He got his hand up first. No? Nothing? What would you like to thank Mom for? Anything you're thankful for? Let me give you a little hint. Did any of you eat this week? Any of you eat anything? Did you starve all week? All right, so what might we want to thank Mom for? Some very practical things. I know the fun park is great, but you didn't all get to go to the fun park. But you did all get to eat. So what, what role might Mom have had in that? Thank you for, for letting you eat. Well, how, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Let's word that better. How about fixing food for you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for fixing food, if your mom did that, to eat. Your mom may not do the cooking, so dad may, we'll come back to dad's day and we'll thank him for that later. He cooks, yeah, I know. Your dad's the chef of the house in your house. Okay, well, yeah, so can I. That's why my wife cooks. What else would we thank mom for? Anything else mom's done for you that she does all the time? What else might mom do for you? Shelter, help, have housing. Thank you for, for the, the house. Um, speaking of the house, how many of your moms clean the house? Uh, how many of your moms may have a hand in cleaning the house? Yeah. Thank you for the house and cleaning my room. Any of you cl have mom clean your room? Hmm. No. No. If... Mom's got lots of dishes. Sometimes mom gets to do the dishes. Sometimes she cleans. Does mom take you any place other than the fun park? She ever get a ride from mom? She takes you somewhere? Yard sales. Well, yard sales. <laughs> well, I guess I'm glad you're thankful for that. Thankful for giving me a ride. How about that? Giving me a ride when I need it. We'll leave the yard sale thing out. Couple more. Anything else? What else? Take, making time for me. Taking time and making time for me. For, we'll put it this way. Thank you for spending time with me. All right. One more. Any, any last one? Here we go. Because my card's getting full. Anything else we can thank mom for or thankful for mom? No, I, I know. For flowers, she. The, okay, quickly. For loving us. That's a good one to close with. Thank you for loving me. All right. Right at the bottom. And we've made our own card to all the moms at West Portland Baptist Church. We didn't need Hallmark and all their little nice sayings and all the things that might come from a pre-bought card. We said a few things without any help. So these are the things and many others we thank mom for. And I hope you have a blessed Mother's Day, moms, as you get the card. It's all for you. And as you think about the things that we're all thankful for our moms for. Have a great day. You can head back to Children's Church and your parents. All right. We are going to be in Genesis this morning, a couple of chapters. Genesis 16, 17, 18, and then ending on 21. Our series on prophecy will leave aside for a week till we finish it out after Mother's Day. It's interesting, on Mother's Day, very often, and somebody said this to me in my last church, so I'm kind of, I, I remember them saying this. They say, how come on Mother's Day, pastors always find in the Bible the most perfect mother they can find? You know, just, uh, just absolutely superb. And all of us moms leave feeling like we can never measure up. You know, I, and I've done that. I've preached on Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she's pretty good, I will say that. She was a pretty good mom, although... If you have a perfect kid, I don't know how you can't be a good mom. Jesus was a sinless little child. But nonetheless, uh, we often do that. So this morning, we're going to look at Sarah, the imperfect mom, the imperfect mother. Oftentimes, here's an illustration of 
what happens in the world that is beyond the normal, the, the, the supernatural, the super. And it happened just a summer ago in 2020. A pizza delivery man named Nick Bostic in Indiana was driving through a neighborhood in the late evening. And as he was driving through this neighborhood delivering pizzas, he drove by a house and he happened to notice this flickering of flame and the front of the house as he slowed down was on fire. He pulled his, his vehicle over and he decided he better check to see if anybody was inside. He went to one of the doors on the side of the building into the front of the building on the side and to his surprise, the door was actually unlocked. So he swung open the door. There was the beginnings of a fire in that, that room and it didn't look like there was anybody there, but there was a stairwell right there. So he runs to the stairwell and as he starts up the stairwell, here comes this little girl, uh, 18-year-old girl who has with her a baby and two other children coming down the steps. And he grabs them and says, you got to get out. you got to get out. And they all ran out to the side door he had just come in. And when they got on the side of the house that is increasingly being uh, burnt and being taken by the fire, it was clear that they realized that their six-year-old sister was not with them. Uh, Nick ran back into that building. And he went back to the stairwell. She was known to be upstairs. That's where her room was. He went up there and he found her in the second floor. And as he turned to come back down the stairwell, it was very obvious he no longer could get back down that stairwell. The flames had moved in that living room that the stairwell came off of to the point that he did not believe he could get through the flames. He went back upstairs into a bedroom and realizing now they were trapped there, he smashed out a window with his bare hands, getting a significant cut on one of his arms. He grabbed the six-year-old, held her in his arms, and he jumped with her. He landed on his side. The other side, he had the girl held to him. Uh, she was fine, except from some smoke inhalation. He suffered burns, smoke inhalation, and this cut that they had to use a tourniquet to stop the bleeding from. He was in the hospital for several days, the first couple of days, trying to repair the damage to his arm. His arm will never be as useful or the same. But he awoke from surgery and from the procedures as a hero. Now, who here can meet that guy's standard? Not me. I'm not going into a burning house. I'm sorry. I'm not doing that. Um, none of us really say, oh, yeah, that's me. I'd be right there. I'm headed up the steps. I can see it now. Um, he's beyond normal. This is so far beyond the average regular that it makes the papers. It makes the news. You can hear about it miles and miles and miles away because it's extraordinary. Most of us don't live in the extraordinary. Most mothers do not live in the extraordinary. Uh, most of motherhood is not extraordinary. Much of motherhood, much of daily living is a struggle. Sarah is the imperfect mom who struggles with the realities of life. It started with when God came to her husband Abram and says, I'm making you a promise that you are going to have children and you're going to be the father of a great nation. And you're going to, as your children expand and as their ranks grow, they'll be as numerous as the sands of the sea. And Abram comes home and tells Sarah this, and Sarah's about 80 years old, 75 to 80 years old, and it's like, that just can't be. She cannot believe that God can do this. And in chapter 16 of Genesis, having this news and having no children yet being born to her, uh, she decides, because she can't believe God's going to do this, that Abram must have it wrong. He must have misunderstood. And so in their society, she took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, in verse 1 of chapter 16, and she allowed Abram to have a child with Hagar. Uh, and so that proceeded to happen. She just couldn't believe God would give them a child. And so Sarah struggled with faith. How many moms struggle with faith? Believing God, believing what God said, second-guessing God. Uh, I think not just moms struggle with that, but all of us at times struggle to believe what God has said. You know, God says this, and, you know, we know what God said, but, you know, that just can't be. Can that be? And we struggle to believe what God said. And as we struggle to believe what God said, we then decide to take matters into our own creative hands. And in our own creative hands, as we take matters into them, 
we come up with plans and ways and things to accomplish what maybe we think God wanted us to do. And so Sarah, because her faith just wasn't strong enough to believe that God could do what he said, decides that this should be the plan. The plan has gone through with. Abram has a child named Ishmael with Hagar, the maidservant. And as you get into chapter 17 of Genesis, immediately as this child comes forth, Sarah knows this was not the right plan. Uh, verse 15 of chapter 17, then God said to Abram, God reiterates this to Abram again, as, Sarah, as for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah, changing the last name, shall be her name, and I will bless her, and also give you a son by her, and I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Verse 17, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his descendants after him. And so God says, no, the plan that Sarah, from her lack of faith, came up with was not God's plan. Any moms ever come up with plans that after you do them, you realize, I don't think God made that plan. I think that was my plan. I don't think God was involved in the plan. That's the imperfection of parenting. Is there a perfect mom or dad hanging around West Portland Baptist Church tomorrow, today or tomorrow or this week or next week or next month on Father's Day? Unlikely, isn't it? And none of us are perfect. Is there a father, a mother, a child here who struggles with believing God and having faith? Yep, a lot of hands perhaps go up to that one. We are imperfect people. Sarah an imperfect lady. Abraham, maybe his faith was a little more solid in what God could do, but he was along with the plan that Sarah made, and he said, Ishmael, let, let Ishmael live before you, God. You've given me this son, Ishmael, and God says, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. Now, I don't think we need a lot, lot of education in medical things to know that, typically speaking, 90-year-old ladies are not around having children, are they? Um, this is not the norm. This is something that if it's ever going to happen is almost, we would call it, miraculous. And indeed it was miraculous. But God can do the miraculous. Isn't that what faith is all about? Trusting God sometimes to do the miraculous? That which humanly somehow seems to be unable to be accomplished? You ever had a, a child as a mom that you say, God, you're going to have to help with this because I don't know what to do? And God has to reach down and sometimes miraculously intervene. If you're that mom and you've prayed that prayer, you understand what that means. Sometimes dads as well pray that prayer. God, I have no wisdom. I have no idea. I don't know what you want to do. And God reaches down and does something that you could not do, that a human could not do, that only he could do. And it stretches and tests our faith and our trust and our belief that God can do things that are beyond what we can do. And so with Sarah, her faith was an imperfection of weakness. She struggled, and as she struggled, she reached down and came up with her own plan. Now, many times as parents, we learn from our mistakes. You ever learn from your mistakes? You know, in the parenting role, when you mess it up as a parent, you say, oh, there was a lesson. Because we are typically, as parents, as moms, as dads, as people, we are typically imperfect. We are typically sometimes people who have to learn by our own mistakes. Sarah's mistake would be a mistake that would land trouble for, for a long, long time. But in spite of her mistake, she is not tossed out. It's interesting. God could say from heaven, look, I've had it with this Sarah lady. You know, this is just too much. 
you know, she's conniving, she's manipulating, she's got her own plans. She threw me aside, the God of heaven, who could do this miraculous thing, makes her own plan, forget them. All right, Abraham and Sarah, you're out of here. Who am I looking for now to be the, 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 the lineage of the nation of Israel that Abraham is starting? We'll find somebody else. But God didn't say that. God doesn't throw us out because we make a wrong choice or a mistake. You know, sometimes when you come to church on Mother's Day and you hear about Mary, you'd think Mary never made a mistake. And there's other ladies in Scripture that you look at and you say, I could never, it seems, be the mother that those people in Scripture are. I want to tell you, there's every one of us who can be the mother Sarah is, if you're a mother out there, because we're imperfect. She's imperfect. And I can tell you this, in spite of her mistakes, in spite of her faith being weak, God didn't throw her out and say, I'm moving on to somebody else. Forget her. I'll, I'll find another person or another couple that want to have kids. Instead, God comes back and he reiterates the promise again and again. And in chapter 18, verse 10 through 15, once again, he reiterates the promise. And once again, Sarah has a hard time believing it. Verse 10 of chapter 18 of Genesis. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. This is God talking to Abraham again. Verse 11, now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, I have grown old. Shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child, since I am, since I am old? Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? There's a good question. Is anything too hard for God? Have you ever been a mom or a dad, particularly mom and Mother's Day? And you've said, this is just too much. I don't even think God can do anything about this. And the question of faith, if we believe in Christ as our Savior, and we're a mother or a mom, is this question that God responds to Sarah with. Is anything too hard for the Lord? What's too hard for God to do? In our imperfections, sometimes it's too hard for us to believe in the Lord. Sometimes it's too hard for us to figure out what to do or what, to, what road to take. But the question God asks, is anything too hard for me, the Lord? And then he followed that up and he says, At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And in verse 15, Sarah denied it. God says, you're going to have a son. And Sarah says, nope, no son. I remember when we were having our second baby, Luke, Lydia was introduced to the idea she was about to have a younger sibling. And Lydia's response to this pending blessing and bundle of joy was this, no baby. No baby, no baby. She was very clear about that, too. As a two-year-old, she didn't speak all her words clear, but she had those two words clear, no baby. Mm-mm, no baby. Sarah says, God, no baby, no baby, no baby. She denied it. Her faith still lacking, her faith still limited, not yet having to learn what God can do. Not having to address the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Parents, how many times have you prayed and said, God, I don't know what you're going to do with these kids of mine or this child of mine. God, I just don't know what you're going to do. But it comes down to, do you believe, is anything too hard for the Lord? And that brings us in this running narrative or story to the chapter Ed read this morning, chapter 21. When indeed, in spite of just months before, Sarah saying, no baby, God is not able. Verse 21, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Because God is able. God is, even in the hand of miraculous, able to do that beyond humanity. And God blesses Sarah in advanced age, 
with a son, the son whom they promised, or the son whom God repeatedly promised to both of them, whom they named Isaac. And it's a wonderful thing because then in Sarah doesn't have to have faith to believe. She has this child and the blessing of this child. And she's learned in her life that God can do what he says. And God does have the ability to do anything. And as she's learned these lessons and these imperfections are being molded to become more like her Savior, Jesus, who would come years later, more like the God of heaven who wants us to have faith. She also then realizes, as this chapter goes on, that she's already made a mistake. Have we ever made a mistake that's hard to get away from? I think all of us have made the mistakes that are easy to get away from. They're easy to put behind us. They're easy to say, oh, never do that again. And there's no lasting results or no lasting ramifications. But in this case, there's a lasting result and a lasting ramification. And it's a young teenage boy named Ishmael who is her husband Abraham's first and eldest son. And as chapter 21 continues to read, uh, at the time of the weaning of Isaac, in verse 8, they have a, a large celebration to celebrate this event. And at this event is Hagar, her maidservant, and Ishmael. And Ishmael, in verse 9, begins to scoff, as it says, or mock. And he begins to mock and scoff at the baby. And Sarah doesn't like that. Any parents like having your kids mocked and scoffed at? Uh, probably not. And remember, Ishmael is not Sarah's. Maybe Abraham's, but he's not hers. And she takes great offense at that and was very displeased, verse 11 says. But she also is displeased in understanding that this was her idea. You ever have to live with your bad ideas? We've all lived with the bad ideas. We've all lived with the things that we shouldn't have done, the things, the places we shouldn't have gone, the choices we shouldn't have made, the moments when our faith was weak and we made a, a maneuver that was wrong, and it just can't be one of those ones that is easily gotten by, put behind. We motor on as if it never happened because there's a 16-year-old boy here that says it did happen. She's the imperfect mom making imperfect choices out of a lack of faith and now she's dealing with the result of that that just continues on and on that's us isn't it and you know in the midst of that I think there's something important to see and that's in your New Testament Hebrews 11 we are studying in our Wednesday night prayer meetings Hebrews 11 and we'll kind of skirt by this verse a little bit when we get to it very shortly but in Hebrews 11 is the chapter where God looks back upon the Old Testament and talks about people who he says are examples to us because of their faith. And when you get to Hebrews 11, verse 11, God says this in hindsight and many years later. He says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a son when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. God looks back upon all this, and what does God say? God says, faithful is Sarah. She's listed amongst the handful of people, God says, exhibited great faith. And you're saying to me, wait a minute, we've just talked for 20 minutes about a lady who didn't have faith, a lady who struggled having faith, an imperfect woman, a woman who it seems like is barely going to find her name in Hebrews 11, being noted for her faith, and yet at the end of her life, what does God say? By faith, Sarah. Because God is working on us. You know, life is not the process of instantaneous perfection the moment you believe in Jesus. Oh, that it would be. That would have been so nice, wouldn't it? Who would not have wanted the moment you believed in Jesus Christ, whether you were five years old in Sunday school or 25 years old in, in church or you're 80 years old, whatever day you came to realize that Jesus died for me and I need to believe that by my own personal faith, God just perfected you. You never would make a bad choice again. You never would sin again. Your faith would be so strong you never would doubt God again. It would be perfect living from then out. Who'd vote for that? We'd all take that option, wouldn't we? Except that's not how it works. It's never been how it works. 
We believe by faith, and then our faith begins to grow. And our lives begin to grow. We begin to mold our lives to be like the Savior. And we are imperfect. And we have to respond multiple times to God like this. Oh, God, forgive me. I messed it up. Because we continually are imperfect. The model of Sarah is not a perfect model. Not even close. The model of Sarah is an imperfect model. With terrible choices at times. An ability to disbelieve God more so than it seems to believe God. But then at the end, as she grows and as time passes and she raises her son Isaac, by the end of her life, God looks back and what does God say? Well, he first says, all of those mistakes, all of those sins, all those judgments that were wrong are forgiven. They're gone. And then he says, what's left is the growing, strengthening faith of Sarah. So then in commentary on her life at the end, God says, by faith, Sarah. Receive strength to conceive seed, bore a son when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. There came a point in time when Sarah says, I believe God can do this. There came a point in time when Sarah saw God do this. There came a point in time when Sarah learned to trust God in the raising of this child. Her faith grew. We're about to the spring season. We're about to plant things in the garden. And you plant your peas today, and maybe wait a week or two, and maybe plant some of those other things that'll frost if perchance we get a late season frost. And within a day, you expect tomatoes, correct, on your little tomato plant? Anybody plant peas yesterday? The peas should be out there harvestable right now, right? 24 hours later, that's all, all it should take, right? Just like that. You know, if peas and veggies grew in 24 hours, I know one good thing about them. We'd never have to weed them. Isn't that wonderful? Think of that. The weeds couldn't grow as fast as that. No, nothing grows like that. I have chickens. You've probably noticed, had them for a long time. We hatched chickens this year. Five of the, the dozen uh, lived and hatched and... Uh, we have five chickens. They're about two months old, just a little more than two months old. And as you suspect, when you're hatching baby chicks, there's a real good chance that some are going to be uh, roosters and some are going to be hens. We obviously are, are hoping for more of the hens than the roosters. This morning, two months later, they're growing fast. And guess what one of those little guys is doing this morning? He's trying to crow. Sounds more like his partners are strangling him. But he's trying to crow because he's a rooster. He's not going to be laying eggs anytime soon. Uh, we won't discuss where he'll be sooner than the hens, but he's not going to be laying eggs. And they're feisty little guys, two of them. I'm sure are roosters because you go in there and you put your hand down and guess what they do? They're not afraid of you at all. They want to peck you. They want to stir up a little war with you. I'm the hand that feeds them, you know? Don't peck me. They're, they're, they're already showing signs that they're roosters. They're growing fast. But the day they hatched, he wasn't crowing. The day he was a little fuzzy yellow fluff ball, he was not crowing, but he crowed quick. He grew fast. God gave us a pattern that likewise our faith starts small and it grows. That might be as a mom, might be as in other things related to our Christian lives, might be as a dad. Our faith starts small and it grows. And if it grows and God has a work through the Holy Spirit in our life, like he did with Sarah, and the progress continues to be made in spite of the fact that we're imperfect and that we fall short and we fail and sometimes make terrible mistakes because we fall short and fail, God says part of the plan isn't to make perfect, full-grown Christians at conception at the beginning of faith, but that we grow and our faith grows. And he looks back on Sarah and says, by faith, Sarah. And that's for you moms who are imperfect and struggling and, and concerned with life and concerned with what to do and hard to believe God and it's hard to trust God and it's hard to, to follow God. And I just feel so imperfect in the midst of all this. For moms in that position, there is a mom just like you. And her name is Sarah. And she ended up with her faith growing, 
her life changing, the molding of God in her midst, and God at the end saying, well done, Sarah, well done. And that's the promise God makes for moms. It's not the promise that we put up the perfect mom on the screen behind me and say, follow her. That's it. Just follow her. Do what she does. Because life is messier than that. Life is more difficult than that. Life is not just a, a putting together of all the good. For every one of those good moms we could put on the screen, they also struggled just like Sarah. They also had their days. Mary, perhaps not so much with, with Jesus, was a perfect child. But they all had their days of struggle. They all had their days of difficulty. They all had their days that they said, is God able to do this? And they all grew through it because God worked in their life. It's not a matter of saying, God, I'm going to leave West Portland Baptist Church this morning and I'm going to be the perfect mom or the perfect dad or the perfect grandparent. I'm not going to purpose in my heart that I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to purpose in my heart, God, that you can just do a work in my life to help me along the way to where I need to get and where I need to go. And I may not even know how you're going to do that, God, but I want to be on that path. I want to be growing, and I want you to help me. And when we dedicate ourselves to that, we will find that whatever is before us in life, whether it be a new child, a new job, a new retirement, a new marriage, <laughs> whatever it might be that's new in life, when we step forth into the unknown, we step forth with a God who says, I can do all things. And we have faith to trust him. Sarah ended by trusting God. And God said, faithful she was. We look at the details, they were messy, they were difficult. But he said at the end, by faith, Sarah. And at the end of your existence here, when all is said and all is done, it's not going to be a perfect picture but we would trust that God could say, by faith, and then insert your name. By faith, so-and-so, they grew and they trusted me. We have a God who's gracious, a God who's merciful, a God who's loving, a God who picks us up when we fail and fall, a God who sustains us when we need it. We have that kind of God. Moms, that's the God you trust in. Today it may be not the greatest Mother's Day, or maybe it is. But it doesn't matter. God is able, whatever you face, to meet you there and by faith help you. Let's pray. Father, may we see the imperfect mom, the mom who struggled, the mom who couldn't believe, the mom who couldn't just wrap her mind to understand the miraculous of what you can do. And sometimes moms in this room have prayed and they've looked at their own children and say, I don't know what to do. God, you're going to have to do something. I cannot imagine what to do. I'm trusting you. And as soon as they pray that prayer, they doubt that you can do it. It's, it's not easy being a human. It's not easy being a parent. It's not easy being a grandparent some days. And yet, we can trust you. And our faith, if it's growing, will be stretched to grow further. And we thank you. We thank you that... You're patient with us, that you're gracious to us. And while we're not perfected yet, you're there standing beside us, arm around us to help us step by step, day by day, problem by problem, situation by situation. Encourage moms not by the picture of the perfect mom, but encourage moms by the hand of God that can reach down from heaven and do even the miraculous when we believe and trust you. And we thank you for every imperfect mom that's here, which is all of them. And we thank you that you are in the midst of their imperfections, slowly perfecting them, slowly working within them, day by day helping each mom to, to follow you and trust you. And in spite of failures and setbacks, steps forward, steps back, there's one thing we can count on, that you are always there. May we always turn to you, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Number 535 in your hymnal to close this morning, 535, the Christian home, which talks about some of the perfect things we desire in our homes, perhaps. But remembering that the, the getting to 535 uh, is a struggle. It's an imperfect science. It's a 
A lot of days where we're back and forth. But God, help us in those days to follow him, to trust him. And in 535, this is the aspiration we have, that he'll work in our lives, in our homes, with our children, and that work in us as parents or grandparents as we follow him. 535, all three verses as we close. thank you that we can think about what you can do in our lives, that you are able, that with you the things that are humanly impossible are possible with you. We certainly are thankful for your power, your abilities, your strength. May we by faith trust to believe that that which you promise us you will deliver. And even things you haven't promised to us directly, you are able. And so we thank you for what you can do. We pray that you'll encourage each mom that's here. Bless them this day. Minister to them. Uplift them and uphold them. We know that the, the job of being a mom is many days seemingly just a part of the routine. But let us on this day be reminded that it's not a routine, that it is a special place, a special position. And we honor them today. And we thank you for what you'll do in our lives. Bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Kitties, get your gift as you leave. Thank you.